Well, it's that time of the week again. It's time for Chit Chat Across the Pond. This is episode number 766 for April 22nd, 2023, and I'm your host, Allison Sheridan. This week, our guest is your favorite psychological scientist, Dr. Marianne Gary of the University of Waikato in New Zealand. How are you doing today, Marianne? I'm I'm fine, Allison, but I want to know if I'm your favorite psychological scientist. Well, wait a minute, though. Isn't Mrs. Gary also a psychological scientist? Yeah, but who's so? <laughs> You're going to make me choose between the two of you? Choose wisely. Who are you interviewing? <laughs> there is that. Hey, so I wanted to get Marianne on, on here because um, one of her grad students and some of her colleagues, she published a uh, paper in the Royal Society about a very, very interesting topic. And I, I want to tease Marianne first because she sends me these incredibly long form things. I mean, like 30 pages of reading to do when my attention span is oh. about as long as a, as a mastodon toot nowadays. <laughs> it's just so hard to read so much. But this one was fantastic. I'm fascinated by this study. I think it's really, really interesting. And let me, let me just give the, the, uh, we'll give it the 30,000 foot view of this is uh -huh. that a, a nice. lot of people believe that given the opportunity or given the circumstance of a pilot being coming incapacitated and they're all, they're the only one on the plane, a large percentage of people actually think that they could land the plane. Um, when, when I knew I was going to be talking about this study, I mentioned it to my brother Grant and he immediately went, went oh yeah, I could do it. And I just thought that was hilarious. But this this has been talked about before, this concept and, and this paper you, and research, you took it, uh, you and this team of people took it uh, a lot further. So maybe talk a little bit about the what, what we already knew and where you went with this. Yeah, so we, here's, here's what we knew before. And by we, I mean the scientific community. Um, what we knew is that some people just think they can do all sorts of things they can't, right? And they, so we we usually think of these as features of a person, right? So, for instance, some people are just straight up narcissists. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that that word gets kicked around in everyday parlance, but you know it's reasonably accurate. Like some little blowhards, you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Right, they right. can do things, all kinds of things. Um, so that's a, a kind of stable personality characteristic of of somebody. So and, and wherever there's they a name go, for that, right? That, that's the Dunning Kruger effect. I've heard about. No, that's a different thing. Oh, that's different. So okay. yeah, so Dunning Kruger, and I have to say, ironically, uh, Dunning Kruger is typically misreported oh. by people. So okay. Mean, so well, set so that like aside. Dunning -Kruger, then. <laughs> Well, Dunning Kruger is very interesting because every everybody knows about it, right? It shows up in everything, except that what it what it means is that um, the people who have like the least amount of skill tend to be the worst calibrated when you ask them to talk about their actual skill, right? So you have because you're an expert in what you do, you have pretty dialed in awareness of your own abilities and also awareness of what you can't do in in the area in which you work, right? So mm -hmm. like, let's say tech stuff or coding or something, right? But someone who's just starting tends to be the worst calibrated and thinks they can do more than they can, typically, typically. And as you learn more, you know, expertise is sometimes described as the process of learning what you don't know. Oh. <laughs> so you start <laughs> right, to become right. more and more dialed in. So Dunning-Kruger refers to this this chunk of people down towards the bottom that they're just least dialed in to uh, their actual skills and abilities. And sometimes the and same guy, Dave Dunning, uh, identified that there's this period of uh, when you're first starting a skill, you have what, what is sometimes called the beginner's bubble, where you think you have the things figured out, but that's only because you don't know Mm -hmm. a lot about it right and so as you start to learn more you start to become more dialed in and be like oh well that's not true that's not true that's not true so basically what what we knew before this paper was that there was a lot of evidence that some people are just it, let's just call them blowhards overconfident <laughs> for various reasons uh and the thing is is like we we also know though that most people in in specific areas will think they're unusually good at what they do. So 
the majority of drivers, for instance, think they're a better than average driver. So this is called the above average effect, right? Oh, yeah. We've, of- we've talked about that together on Chit Chat Across the Pond. And I, th- I always thought that was fascinating. There's some number larger than 50%. Of drivers. 90% of drivers think they're better than average. I must be right. a truly terrible driver because I'm pretty sure I'm below average. So I must be yeah, like I don't the think bottom I'm a, 3%. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, 40% of software engineers in firms think they're in the top 5% of the software engineers in their firm. Oh, really? Oh, I yeah, like that yeah. one too. Um, most students think they're above average. Mm-hmm. Uh, and... Seventy percent of uh, professors think they're above average, right? Or no, they think they're actually in the top chunk of professors. So hmm. it's just funny. So so that can't really be explained by rampant narcissism. It's just like, what is that about? So so there's most of us, or the many of us, in in at least in specific, we'll call them domains areas, right? Think that they're we're we're just not dialed in to how good or bad we are. Okay. So we thought. You know, we don't we don't really do personality stuff in my lab or stable features of you know clinical characteristics like narcissism. We don't do any of that in my lab. But what we do is we know that uh, the features of the some characteristics of the task that you're doing, like the environment you find yourself in right in that moment, can turn people into temporary narcissists. Can turn people into temporary blowhards. Uh, make them really confident about things. Make them think that something that they're reading is true or easier than it is. Or, you know, uh, and, and this is a a phenomenon that's related to the stuff I've talked to you about before in previous chit chats about you know people remembering things that never happened to them. Uh, and we thought, well, maybe there's a role here for for creating situations like that in which people think, oh, well, this is easy for me to imagine doing, for instance. So, so something you could you could insert that that would make them think they could do something they can't. Yeah, just ordinary people, right? Just okay. ord- ordinary people, not like just your random, like specific blowhards, but, but ordinary people. So could we take the people who, for instance, you know, the 90% of drivers who think they're above average, and could we, could we create a situation like that out of anybody, but for having to do with something we thought, well, we need a really preposterous skill, something that everyone should know they can't do. And we thought about a whole lot of things. And so one of the, one of the skills that we tinkered with was uh, eye surgery. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we just thought Please people, tell me people get- don't think they can do that. Well, we we didn't, yeah, we didn't actually go down that road because it was kind of gross. The, I mean, unsurprisingly, the videos of people doing like corneal repair. I was like, Ugh. oh, I know the uh, one you should have done. You, you know how if you've watched Mash, you're pretty sure that you could open an airway by punching a hole in somebody's throat and sticking oh, yeah. a big pen yeah, in. Yeah, we did think of that one. Did you really? <laughs> you did. I'm think positive of that I could do that, and I would know to do yeah. it in the right circumstance. I know it. Yeah, yeah, we did think of that one, but it didn't have enough steps. <laughs> um, and also when you see it, like when you see it on YouTube, so we can't find a video. So we see it on YouTube. Um, it's like, a here's what to do if, you know, and it's, it's not a real person, obviously. Right. Right. So we rejected those things. And then, then we thought, what about those people who sometimes say, uh, you know, I could land a plane in an emergency. And cause you hear about this, it's like apocryphal, right? Right. There's, what is it? Mythbus- Mythbusters even did this. They did a show on Mythbusters. So first we set out to say, well, can, can is it really a myth? And it turns out, so Mythbusters did this show where they taught, I forget the guy's names on Mythbusters because I don't watch it, but but I watched this episode and they have the guys who, they they went in a, not in an actual plane, but they went in a flight simulator like they trained pilots on. Uh, and they tried to land a plane. And uh, the one of the guys I think he landed in the woods 10, 10 miles away from where he was supposed to go and like killed everybody on board. <laughs> uh, and the well, other they're guy- they're testing it on themselves. The they're, they're having yeah, themselves yeah. try to do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In the flight simulator, right? And the okay. other guy, I think, landed the plane, but it did a whole lot of damage. I mean, sh- shocking, I know. Uh, <laughs> and then they wouldn't let them, then they had another part where they did it again. They wouldn't let them talk to the tower and they just both crashed and burned, crashed and burned, crashed and burned. So they're just like- here, the myth, and the Mythbusters conclusion was, no, random person, you can't land a plane. Okay. Uh, and most pilots will tell you, they'll just snort and say things like, I'm really tired of hearing people say that they can do this. <laughs> and, 
you know, yeah, like I'm sure everyone's going to write to me. So let's just preempt this right now. And instead you can write to Allison uh, <laughs> saying, well, what about that guy in Florida who landed the plane? And I'm just like, yeah, okay. He, I think was like a flight simulator. Um, you know, that game. Yeah. I yeah, think he played that right, game. Right. A fair bit. And also he. Um, so maybe new terminology. In yeah. Order to and be able talked to, to me by the tower. Okay. He was talking that down by the tower. So I'm not not to take away from what the guy did, right? But it's just like it's a it it's a particularly lucky. yeah, and it was a particularly unique set of circumstances, mm-hmm. right? So in general, no, you can't land a plane. Okay. Uh, probably people listening to this right now are saying to themselves, "I could land that plane," or maybe even saying it out loud <laughs> to us in their ears, "I could land that plane." And we call these people men, but we'll <laughs> we'll get back to that. In a minute. <laughs> I was wondering how long it would take us to get to the men bashing. But, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Stand it's by. So fun, funny. Stand by. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, it's yeah. science. No women listening to this is going to be going to be like, no, that's shocking. Uh, <laughs> so here's what we did. We conducted two experiments, almost 800 people. And we asked some of them, but not others, to watch a video of a guy landing, a, a pilot's landing a plane. And and it, they were commercial pilots. I forget the name of the in, aircraft. In the video. It was, yeah, in the video, uh-huh. uh, you can't really see them doing anything. There's a whole bank yeah, their of their hands are controls. covering the the controls. So their hands it's like are covering from the, the controls. Back. Yeah, it's from the back, like you're just peering in the cockpit. Uh, so you see them doing like basically, it looks like they're driving a fancy car, and then the plane land. Well, they they take it over hills and mountains and over houses, and then onto the tarmac, right? And they land the plane. And so, so there's literally no instructional value. To this, no. right? None at no. all. No, in yeah. fact, right? Yeah. So one of our um, one of the co-authors, Rachel Zayons, at the University of Otago's dad was a pilot for Air New Zealand for years and years and years and years. And was involved in training pilots and stuff. And he watched this video. So Rachel said, "Dad, look at this video. Would it help someone learn how to land a plane?" He said, "This video is absolutely useless." <laughs> okay, good. Oh, I also want to jump in. Uh, the way you chose the the people that you had do this was use the Mechanical Turk, which is a yes. is a tool you can use where you can pay people minuscule amounts of money to do little tiny tasks. And so yeah. um, you eliminated anyone who you asked them what something like what kind of pilot are you or something like that. So if they they responded, well, I'm this kind of pilot, they were out. Their their responses didn't count. Um, and you did uh, ask their uh, their sex or gender, I don't know which, but whichever you knew they were, who was male and female in this test. We asked them how they identified gender wise. Okay. What language they speak, okay. um, their age, so and that, we eliminated. Yeah, we also set. asked them questions about if they played like flight simulators, or we and we got rid of those people. So these are people who don't. Yeah, they zero. got to do it, but you ignored their results. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. Um, and we had, you know, the age of people. The mean, um, the mean age was forty, which is pretty good, right? So it's not like we're getting just. Uh, let's say college students who are not as calibrated about their own skills as, as uh, frankly, they should be in across a number of dimensions. All right. So these are actually like a legit grown ups. Um, and, okay. and a good chunk of people, uh, 40, you know, plus or minus. So that's good. Uh, okay, so yeah. So, that, so watching this video, you don't minutes, show the video to all of them. You show the video no, to half of them. Some of them, but not others. Yeah. Cause they, we don't show the video to the controls. Right. Okay. Uh, it's a little less than four minutes, this video, as you said, no sound. Uh, so you see from the back of the flight deck, you see the view of the flight deck. So I assume you're going to put this article in the show notes because it's open yep. source. So if people want to go and click on, the, we link, we point to the materials and, and the data in case you want to totally nerd out uh, <laughs> in the article so you can see exactly what this is. So you can see their hands and, and what they're doing, it's, but it's somewhat obstructed. Uh, just because the angle it's shot at, so it doesn't it doesn't teach anybody to do anything, right? It's really just you watching someone sort of glide in and land a plane. Okay. So the people who see the video, they see the video, and then people who don't, obviously they don't. And then then they're asked this these two questions, and one is um, how confident you can land the plane without dying, and how confident are you that you could land the plane as well as a pilot could. And they have um, to answer on a scale. And we varied. 
sometimes we do the scale from zero to a hundred, like not at all confident to very confident or not, you know, that kind of thing. Um, And we ask them at the end, for instance, have you ever flown a plane before? Have you ever landed a plane before? Uh, And then here, this is important. We asked everybody, we always ask everybody, how much expertise do you think is involved Mm. in doing this task? So here, like in landing a plane. So like no expertise to a great deal of expertise on a scale, right? Do you ask them that before the answer the question of how confident are they? Afterwards, afterwards, afterwards. Okay. Afterwards. Uh, and everybody all the time is on what we say in, you know, and it's in data analysis, the ceiling. So they're up banging their head on the ceiling of it takes a lot of expertise to land a plane. And that's important for what so I'm going to they're not delusional about, about so, what it takes. Yes, they're exactly. They're just delusional about their own abilities. Yeah, exactly. Because our results would be far less interesting if people thought, eh, it's just easy to land a plane because you could just say, well, you've got a bunch of dumbasses in your, <laughs> your experiment. We, we just had like actually ordinary people in our experiment. So anyway, then we, you know, we're going to, we ask them these questions right afterwards. Um, and we assume that what people are doing is operating on a kind of gut feel or hunch. And, and, and so what we know when people operate and make these kind of gut hunch sort of decisions is that they make them on the basis of how easy it is to bring to mind thoughts and images and feelings of doing the task. Hmm. Right. So if you go, if you, if you think this through and you say, well, people have seen the video now, it's easier for them to bring to mind thoughts and images and feelings of maybe them doing the task, whether they see themselves in the situation or it's just the task itself, which is landing the plane successfully, uh, then you would predict then that people who saw this video, even though it was just four minutes and not instructional by any measure, would be more confident that they could land the plane. And that's what we saw. Uh, No, remember there are two questions, right? So could you land a plane as well as a pilot could, or could you land the plane without dying? So let's call this without dying question, the low bar, and as well as a pilot could, the high bar. And so almost thankfully, we get different responses here. (laughs) So people are less confident they could do it as well as a pilot could. So at least there's, they're throwing the pilots a bone, which is, (laughs) you know, I guess nice. But they still think, you know, they're still more confident that they could, that they could do it if they see the video than if they don't. Uh, And that's what I thought was pretty amazing, right? And you know, since we foreshadowed this, and and because it's fun, uh, men are more confident than women, By even how if much? they don't see what the kind, video. What kind of margin? I mean, on average, do you have a, any numbers on that? I couldn't. I looked for that in the in the, uh, in the paper, and I didn't see it. But it, as I recall, in the news articles, I heard about this study that it was a pretty, or it might not have been about this study, but in in other studies, that it was a pretty significant margin difference. Yeah, I think it depends how you calculate it. And I don't remember it exactly. But if you're thinking about maybe 20, 30 percent higher, more confident, is that what you? Yeah, I think that's what it was. Yeah. So, it right. It doesn't mean that they were. It just it's compared to um, women in the same condition. So, yeah, it's very interesting uh, and fits with some other uh, work and even just survey stuff. Uh, that men tend to be more confident about their abilities than than women are, to the surprise of no woman anywhere. <laughs> you know, when when you when I got to that part in the and talking to you about it too, it started to make me think about two angles to that. Is as a in the workforce, as a woman, if you are not portraying as much confidence as the men, that you know you're at least as good as probably possibly better that you're going to be perceived as not as good at it because they're showing this confidence and you and you're not and it's a it's a pretty common thing to know to hear that women don't project themselves above what they think they can do and men can can you know blow hard it better than than women can so as a woman uh, learning that skill of you know pretending you know a little more than you do which sounds really hard 
So there's the flip side as a leader looking at your employees, looking at two people who say they can do the task or, you know, trying to get a promotion or whatever that that take into account the fact that the women are probably not over stating what they can do as much as maybe the men are on average. Yeah, uh, there's a whole literature. And I mean, I don't work in this area, but there's a I know there's a whole literature for instance, in social psychology literature, particularly that applied to the workforce, in that women, for instance, are terrible, terrible negotiators. And uh, I would urge every woman to read a book called Women Don't Ask, written by a proper social psychologist who's got an expertise in you know the, the research about negotiating. And it's a related idea, is that, you know, so men are much more comfortable at trying things on than women are. Uh, so uh, what we don't know here is whether men are somehow responding to this question differently for different reasons. Like, are they just trying it on or kind of blowharding? Hmm. Uh, and women are more calibrated. So you don't know. It's, it's kind of interesting. Like, uh, well, who's more accurate? You know, what's so I don't know what the calibration issue here is, but it's interesting because, you know, of course, this finding fits with we have this in the paper, you know, that YouGov survey, uh, which is that 12 percent of men thought they could win a point against Serena Williams in a game uh, and 12 percent, 12 percent of men. Um, How many women and 3 percent of women who I want to kick out of the club made the same claim, but <laughs> but at least it's. You know, 12% of men, only 3% of women. And then uh, there was another YouGov survey. I always show these whenever I present this work in a talk, right? I always, it's that um, they asked men and women to uh, identify which animals they could beat in a fight. <laughs> really? Like cobras, bears, and eagles. Yeah. Cobras, yeah. bears, uh, and eagles? More men than women. Yeah, more men than women claim they could beat every single animal. So, you know, there is another uh, another angle to this. Maybe they can, Marianne, maybe they can land the plane. Oh, yeah. Maybe that's yeah. it. Well, that's right. Maybe the men are just more accurate and women are underestimating their abilities, or maybe men are just more capable. That's probably, mm. you know, we got to take that into account, right? That's probably right. That's probably right. But it is, you know, it is interesting uh, that we see this this gap. Uh, and I, like I said, it's not my area, but it's always the thing that people want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. It, it does. It is interesting. W one of the things back on the, uh, on the, the study, looking at uh, video and no video and the, the, the comparisons, the, I, I know this is nerdy to ask about, but I was really intrigued by the way this is graphed in the article. So, Oh, the, the violin plots, yeah. Yeah, they're called violin plots. I call them bowling pin plots, but uh, violin plots. So in the in the vertical axis is the confidence from zero to 100. And the mm. width of the bar, let's call it the violin bar, the width of the bar is changing as you go up to show you what the distribution looks like. So instead yeah. of just in a horizontal axis in a single line, you know, it's 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 two axes, it's in the width of it. And I thought that was a really neat way to graph it because you can look at it, if you look, for example, on the um, video versus no video on can you do it as well as a pilot could, Without the video, basically the the, gra the bar is really fat down at the bottom, and then there's a little slate bulge above 50% where it, the crazy people live. Uh, but then if you look at it after <laughs> taking the video, that bottom isn't super fat anymore. It's it's pretty narrow. It's like half width, and then it yeah. and, and it stays pretty high, like 25%. That's a, a, the the mean is 25% of the people think they can do it. Right. So as if you well think as a of pilot, like after seeing the video. Right. Right. So th these are nice, these plots, because as you say, they show the distribution compared to a bar graph, which is fairly useless and in, at, and at worst conveys the idea that um, all the points are the same. The Equally distribution is the same throughout uh -huh. throughout the bar. Right. Um, and so it's only relatively recently uh, in my career, I would say five, 10 years that that these have been become more and more easy to do. So um, R, which is a, a language 
a data and analytic language that was that's free and uh, is very popular now. Just swept around. It's just the, the letter it, R is the name of it's it. It's just capital R. And mm-hmm. ironically, quite ironically, although no one here likes when I say this, but I don't care, Allison, because I'm talking to you, and it's just us. Uh, but R was developed at the University of Auckland, so it was developed in New Zealand. And I always say, who would pick the one letter that New Zealanders can't say? <laughs> And name their <laughs> software after it. It's just. Do you ask Mrs. Anyway. Gary to say it just for the comedy? Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, okay. That's pretty funny. But anyway, when, yeah, and it's great because if you use R, if you use R code, and you can write an R. Then of course ChatGPT can help you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can do all kinds of things, and you can also go to an employer and say, "Why are you paying for SPSS, which costs a squillion dollars a year, when I, when I can do this for free?" Right. So you can make these nice plots, and then you can see if your if uh, listeners want to just look at these figures, like Figure One, Figure Two. You can think of the no video control conditions as like a balloon of a certain shape, and then you can kind of imagine that the video condition is that balloon squeezed differently. So you're moving people around, and you Up can the kind of then. Vi- you know, visualize yeah. the effect of, of the video. Yeah, I I got excited about these graphs and I I uh, tried to do it in Excel and then I did some searching and it said, okay, there's this this plugin called Excel Stat. You can try that. Okay, I should put the plugin in. I couldn't find the thing that said how to do it and it was going to use Python. And then I went online and I found, uh, uh, oh man, I just, I went down about 42 rabbit holes. I probably spent two hours trying to do this. And uh, Marion kept saying use chat GPT, but I was asking chat GPT, but the language, I didn't know what it was. And apparently it was R. I never did succeed at it. I was able, um, like she said, you can download the data from their, uh, from her, um, uh, from this paper, you can download the the source data and then uh, try to run R against it. I, I did not succeed and I've disappointed myself. I may keep trying. That's okay. I wanted to you make those start- graphs on men and women. That's what I wanted to see. Oh, right. Yeah. So you can start by, um, if you get an app called R Studio, hmm. I think it's two. Yeah. R Studio. It's just a nice front end for R. Oh, okay. So you can see the coding, you can do whatever. And then R will ask you, it will just, you know, it just runs R with a front end. And so it, you'll be asked at some point to install different, basically libraries mm-hmm. that do certain kinds of things. And when you run some code, if it doesn't have that like library in, it will say that it needs to go get it. And then you just allow it to go get it. So it's 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 pretty good. I'm pretty sure I did install R using Homebrew, but I didn't know what to do next. So I didn't, I didn't, by that time oh, I'd right. spent two hours and that's why the article that I was writing yesterday and the day before and the day before right. isn't done yet. Well, this is well, this should be your next thing that you do where you teach people how to do R and that way you can learn to do it too. My, my next obsession, right? Yeah, your next obsession. So yeah. um, there, there were actually two separate studies, I, and I didn't quite understand why this was done twice. You did it with a small sample size. Is it the same study twice, just two different sample sizes? Uh, it was the same study with a larger sample. Okay. Uh, but the first time, and that's good because we want to replicate, science needs to replicate, right? So mm-hmm. uh if we had just done experiment one, experiment two, and experiment two with a much larger sample to make sure that we could uh, replicate the basic pattern, but then also with uh, a larger sample size, you get a more precise estimate of the size of the effect. And that's the those error bars that you see in the plots are around the mean. And the these error bars, which are called confidence intervals, they give you an idea of the plausible range of values in the population, because it's always what we're trying to do is estimate what is the actual value in the population. So uh, so that's one reason to replicate something. So science always needs to replicate. But what we had noticed in the first experiment is that we had this effect where if you were asked um, the as well as a pilot could question first, it kind of through cold water on your confidence. And we're like, what is that about? So then we tried to manipulate it. Oh, We just did it again to make sure that that really was a thing. And it turns out it was a thing. So it's almost like being asked the question, could you do this as well as a pilot could before you were asked, could you land a plane makes people have some kind of reality check and they calibrate better and, they're, and they're, their confidence isn't boosted as much. 
Well, hang uh, on. So that's kind of cool. On. I'm looking at the graphs, and it looks to me like it says the other way around. So if the question asked first was, as well as a pilot could, the uh, confidence bars are higher. Look at the top. Look at the top on page eight, figure three on top. So the question asked first, without on. dying. Right. So they're so if you're asked the without if you're asked without the with if you're asked the without dying question first mm -hmm. now your confidence so now look at those hmm, let me see how do I say this look at that left panel the left side of the dashed line mm -hmm. so right. what what you see is the confidence is higher than it is if you go over to the without dying question when that comes second which is on the right side of the panel hmm. I must, I don't know if I'm looking at, I, I think I'm looking at the same graph, but it, to me, like if we just look at uh, asking without dying first. Yep. Oh, I see. Boy, this, this is hard. So what, what Marianne and I are looking at, which you can't even see, which makes it even harder to follow, is eight of these <laughs> violins. The ones on the, the four on the left are question asked first without dying. The four on the right are question asked first as well as a pilot could. So within the set of without dying, there's four different scenarios, video and no video twice, one without dying question, and as well as a pilot could question. The results of that. Well, yeah. What you see is when you're asked first about, could you land this plane as well as a pilot could, which is the bunch of plots on the right-hand side, you see mm -hmm. that there's no... There's, I mean, there's confidence, but there's nothing really going on. So it's as though people thought, mm, hang on, you know, like, could I, am I really as good as a pilot? So that's as opposed to just, could you do this without dying, which we consider to be, and I say this with some irony, an easier task. <laughs> uh, right. Well, and so right. it's, it's as, it's as though the, um, as well as a pilot could question first, it's like, hang on, could you do this as well as a pilot could, makes them go mm, and recalibrate everything. Yeah. So it's the only thing that we've, we found that kind of arrests that overconfidence and doesn't totally, right? Because if you look, you just see on a hundred, on a hundred point scale, people are still roughly at about 25, which is not great. Yeah, that's astonishing. So yeah. what what do you do next with uh with results like this? What what does this I assume what you want it makes you ask other questions. You're going to there's there's something else you're going to want to know. Yeah, um well first of all I just want to say I'm happy to crush this dream cuz this is a dangerous dream. <laughs> right? I don't want someone on my plane thinking that and I'll just use this pronoun as the placeholder. He could land the plane, <laughs> right? Uh, well, see, I do. I do because do if you? there's only if there's a person on the plane who thinks they can do it, does that increase the probability that they'll be able? Oh, to Oh, and do you're it? all gonna, yeah. Well, if there's no other option, yeah, I suppose if there's no other option, right. I think you should try and land the plane. And look, you know, like just just to circle back here uh, to this, why why are people overconfident like in general if you think about it uh overconfidence probably has some uh adaptive benefit like back when we were just cave people you know mm -hmm. so you had to be able to run with a pack that wanted you to run with it and so it was probably beneficial to think that or to present yourself as someone who could do things that we might today call stretch goals. <laughs> yeah. So right. like I can do this thing. Yeah. yeah? A stretch you would have been goal. beneficial. Yeah. So you could, right. Um, I wouldn't say that landing a plane is a stretch goal, but, but maybe, maybe, right. But it's just the same kind of mechanism so that, you know, it's, it's good to present yourself as more confident if you want to be able to have a pack, the safety and security of a pack that's going to protect you like in, you know, prehistoric times. Cause if you, you know, Back in those days, if you didn't have a pack that you could run with, you didn't have access to resources like food and safety, and you could be picked off from the pack and killed. So it's good to appear confident. So that's this is why the idea goes that people have a disposition to be maybe confident about things that they can't yet do. And then also, if you think about the relationship between co confidence and maybe optimism, 
you want to get out of bed in the morning, wake up every morning thinking that you can do some things that maybe you haven't done before. Right. So mm-hmm. all this stuff is probably an adaptive characteristic. Right. Uh, but we we try to push on it and take it to its extreme. Because sometimes like when people say, why why would people think this? And the, the fact is, it's like most of these weird phenomena, beliefs or tendencies or claims or even the way memory works. When we really push on them and take them to extremes, what we're doing is taking something that we have probably because it serves some adaptive function most of the time. So then we're distorting it. So this is a distortion of things that probably most of the time are good. Right. Uh, so where are we going to take so women, this next? Women need to get more of it. I think women need to get more of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, I mean, I, I'll tell you what. If you read this, I don't know if you have read it. And now that you're retired, you, I guess you don't need to. But this, this <laughs> Women Don't Ask book. I read this. My friend told me to read this once. Um because I was negotiating for something. And my friend told me to read this book. And she said, just be careful because you're going to get angry. Mm-hmm. And I read it on the plane on my iPad. And if it had been an actual book, I would have thrown it across the plane of half a dozen times. Oh, no. Because you didn't Cause I was, You didn't agree with it or it just made you angry because you knew it was true? It made me angry that I that I didn't know that I could be behaving that way. Like in a good way, like here's things I should be doing that I'm not doing. Here's things men tend to do that I don't do, that that a lot of women tend not to do. And that made me angry. It made me angry that I, because I don't think of myself as a, like a pushover, right? It made me angry that I didn't know these things. Hmm. And so that's why, that's why I now proselytize and tell all sorts of women to read that book. Women don't ask, read it, read it, read it. And there's a follow-up called ask for it, but I think women don't ask is just fantastic. Um, and yeah, so I think women could do with more confidence. Like I'm not, I'm not a social psychologist. I'm just, I'm just a cognitive psychologist. So I do this kind of stuff, like skills and memories and problem solving and and whatever. And what we're really talking about is women and men, and in at workplace and negotiations and whatnot. This is social psychology, so not really my my area. First and foremost, I don't have any social skills, but <laughs> uh, but I'm not a social psychologist. But yeah. I know, and I but I've read some of this work, and not being an expert, I will say th- this book is great. And in general, you, I think you've, you've hit a real problem. Um, but now that that digression is over, um, where are we going next? <laughs> where are you going? Well, yeah. you know, we've just submitted a paper, a manuscript to a journal, a different journal, um, same, uh, many of the same set of authors, led again by Kayla Jordan. Uh, who's now Dr. Kayla Jordan. Uh, so I know it's great. Um, so what, what we did is we started, well, this is at least an overconfidence that um, is not fatal, which is good. And I just, I noticed this weird thing when, you know, we were all under our shelter in place orders, right. Mm-hmm. In the before times. Uh, well, or the after times. So I was watching um, Netflix and I was watching this Danish TV series on Netflix, uh, a political drama called Born. And it's subtitled and it has to be because Danish sounds like, I don't know, Dr. Seuss tripping on acid. It just does. (laughs) There's no, like, you can't understand. I mean, if you're Danish, I'm sorry, but I'll tell all my Danish friends this too. It just does. And you can't really understand anything they're saying. So, but what I thought was after about the third episode, I thought I'm learning Danish. This is this is also a great side benefit because when I go back to Denmark, because I I go there sometimes because they have a great autobiographical memory center. I go there. I'll be able to have better conversations with people, and they don't have to speak in English. Uh, and so then I turned off the subtitles to quiz myself, and I within a. M- 10 seconds thought, oh, this, I don't know any, what is happening? I don't understand any of this. <laughs> then I thought it was a bad scene. So I turned it back on and went on and off like this for about 15 minutes. And I thought I was finally convinced that I wasn't learning Danish and there's some kind of illusion going on. Oh, so so the subtitles are like to... watching a video of somebody land a plane. Yes. Maybe. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what I wondered. So we tried this. We turned this into an experiment and we showed people short video clips from different shows. One one was this political drama and the other one was a show, great show on Netflix called Rita, still Danish, about a school teacher. Mm -hmm. And you either saw the clip and we just... We had had different clips because we did just so the this effect I'm going to tell you about is not, you know, tied to a specific clip. It's not. Uh, So we either showed you the clip. Well, we showed you the clip, but we either showed it, showed it to you with subtitles or without subtitles. And it's like a minute. Right. It's not long. It's shorter than the plain video, if I remember correctly. And then we asked you questions like, uh, you know, how confident are you that you could follow Danish instructions in an emergency or read the weather forecast or make friends if they spoke only Danish? And it really, it boosted, if you saw the subtitles, it boosted your confidence that you could do these things time and time again. It was fantastic. Oh, nice, nice. Now, was it, and then, of course, it, it was significant? Oh, yeah, how much it totally. It? And then, yeah, yeah. And if we then gave you a Danish quiz because that's the obvious answer well maybe you are learning something from the subtitles and it had words that were in the scene but also Mm -hmm. like the most common words in danish like the okay (laughs) we asked people just to transcribe what they just to write down what they thought the words meant they just were completely first of all a the same and b on the floor so that was pretty fun. <laughs> but the same, you mean the people who didn't watch the the subtitles and the people who did? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So the subtitles weren't doing jack, except mm-hmm. making you more confident that you could do this thing. Are the people angry afterwards? No, when, when I don't they think realize, so. I think, or is it just no, more like, oh, that's think interesting? Those, yeah, I think people always think those kinds of things are interesting, right? I think they always think those kinds of illusions are interesting. I think people like to learn that about themselves. I think because they haven't, you know, they haven't maybe, they don't do anything where they really make it like an ass of themselves. They don't hurt anybody else, right? They don't embarrass themselves in front of anyone. So it's a private response. So, you know, in fact, we we don't talk to them personally. They get everything in, in writing so they can have their own private reaction. But usually people just write, this is interesting. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. But this yeah. is this is crushing of dreams. Because I think we all thought we could fly the plane. Yeah, but see, like I said, oh, that's a dream. I'm okay to. <laughs> You're okay to crush that one. <laughs> I'm okay to crush that dream. Yeah. Be yeah. nice to the pilot. Don't don't hurt them. Don't don't hurt her. She needs to fly, she needs to fly the plane because trust yeah, exactly. me, nobody on the plane exactly. can. Yeah, you know where I want to take this is um, the obvious the obvious application of this kind of work. Although we need to move into that area is to see what happens in education, because there's this idea in education that, um, you know, you start off with things that are easier and build confidence, and then you bring in more and more difficult or exceptional examples. Uh, and, And it is possible that by doing that kind of thing, what you're doing is just creating this illusion of overconfidence, and then it would miscalibrate you as a student thinking about how much maybe time you had to put into something or how well you knew what you were talking about and so on. So we want to repeat these kinds of uh, studies. Like, so for instance, adding subtitles to a lecture, that's a very common thing. Like you watch a recorded lecture, if you have subtitles there, and I don't, I mean like English lecture, English subtitles, so same language subtitles, would you think you were learning more about that topic than you were actually learning. So I think that's a really interesting question. And I think oh, we're going to try and yeah. investigate that soon. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. I I know it changes the way I think about what I'm watching. Um, Does the, it? it yeah. Well, probably the biggest thing is I hate it on, on comedies because it ruins the joke right. because the timing is lost. Oh, because the timing's off. And, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. And so I find myself a little uh, angry. But there's certain shows right. where it's like, I can't understand them. I need the subtitles. And then I, or closed caption. I forget which, I think we may be misusing the word there, but uh, it's. Yeah, um, subtitles is a generic term. Okay. Okay. Right. And when they're in your language, it's it's a caption. Yeah. That, that'll be interesting to see what that does. That sort of relates, circles back to work you've talked about before of whether, 
you retain information better if you take notes or not? Oh, yeah. And also, if you retain information better, if it's a little more difficult. Oh, right. Like if it's a little bit more challenging to. um, So one of the one of the ideas is that when you're taking notes, you have to work in the moment to distill out the essence because you can't transcribe when you're taking notes. Right. So it injects a little bit of challenge into the task, a little bit of difficulty, effort. Let's call it effort. Okay. Into the task. So there's this idea in. cognitive psychology called desirable difficulties, which is just a little bit of challenge or effort injecting it into a task, like with note-taking, makes you remember that thing better. And so that's, that's, I think that's an interesting idea. I do like the idea of a little bit of effort. Um, Have you ever been in a class where, I'm I'm sure everybody listening has, where you're in a class and uh, you start to get behind, and you're and you're really concentrating because because it, it's difficult, and you're really working on it. But you reach a point where you realize you're never going to catch up. Like you're yeah. over the, you're over the hump. You're on the other side, and you kind of throw yeah. up your hands. You may even giggle like, <laughs> I, "I got nothing. I'm never going to get this." I saw that happen in an entire class one time. It was a uh, quantum mechanics class by, taught by uh, Professor Van Hoven. And the entire class just started laughing, like, what is this guy talking about? Nobody knew what he was talking about. And Steve was in the class, and he developed a theory. He said, I think that the Russians, this is during the Cold War, the Russians have in, have uh, infiltrated our, our university system, and they're teaching absolute gibberish to the engineering students, and our entire society is going to collapse as a result in, in 20 or 30 years. That's how bad this was. Did the guy was. ever know? Did he get it? Did he realize that I don't he was know. losing it? I don't know. I have no idea. Quantum mechanics. It's really interesting you say this. Um, I, when I was a grad student, one of the things that I wanted to study was that feeling in a in a student. Ooh. And I, it was inspired by this Far Side cartoon I had seen, where the you know I, you probably have seen this. Where the kid's in the class and he raises, he has his hand up and he says, can I go now, Mr. Whatever my name is? My brain is full. And I wanted to study. <laughs> I wanted to study that feeling when you just think that's it. I can't hold on anymore. It's just running out like a, like a glass that's running over. Buffer overflow. Yeah, that's Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I just thought that would be like it because people have that feeling. And where, where does that feeling like how accurate is it? Hmm. Uh, and what are the consequences of it? And what, like, what, what can you come back from it? Yeah, I, I think it, my, my guess is I would say is that it, it depends on the instructor, the person trying to pour mm. the information in. And the, the example mm. I'd give is, is Barton and me with Programming by Stealth is we started doing video for Programming by Stealth, even though we don't record the video he needs to see when I'm slamming my head on the desk because I have no clue to what he's talking about when he's lost me. Oh, yeah. And and it really, and really he helps. And now he'll go, you got that look on your face right now, you know, until so I'll say, okay, <laughs> I lost you back like 15 minutes ago when you said blah, blah, blah. And so he'll go back and he'll explain it a different way. Um, but if you don't have somebody who's willing to do that or able because there's 600 people in the lecture hall or something, you know. Um, yeah, it, it can be highly dependent on that, whether that can be fixed, whether you can, you know, open it back up and, you know, scrape out the goop that didn't make any sense and start pouring in it again. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. It's fun research. Yeah, there's a whole lot of things to be investigated here. One of the other things we're doing right now, we're just in the early days of this, so I don't really know how it's going to shake out, but I was fascinated on one of my trips to Japan when one of my colleagues was explaining to me that the kanji often look like the thing they mean. What's, so the what's kanji, a kanji? It's like the Japanese characters. Oh, okay. okay. They're like, like the, they come from Chinese. So like the kanji for that means tree in mm-hmm. Japanese looks like a tree. And so if you Google it, you'll see what I mean. And the kanji for fire looks like a campfire. And I th- and I thought, I wonder if you started off thinking, so somehow I took away from this that all the kanji look like the thing that they mean, which is manifestly not true. Because even Japanese people only learn some kanji 
because the rest of them are preposterous and it's not like you can recognize them. So, so I thought, oh, once I realized that some kanji, only some kanji look like the thing that they mean, then I thought, I wonder if you could get people to think kanji, the same kind of thing as the plane, right? Sure, I could learn kanji or sure, I could understand Japanese just by showing them easier kanji first and then harder kanji. <laughs> and that's what we're playing around with now. You've got more people like, to torture? Yeah, more people to torture. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I am interested in these. Uh, it's This is called this idea where you step back from yourself and you think about what you know and you don't know, like we were talking about the beginning of our conversation is called metacognition. And it's one of the secrets of learning new things. So like when you work with BART, you have to be able to, to monitor what you know and what you don't know. And at least say, I'm lost, or I understand this, but that's where it stops. Or sometimes you relate something, like you do this a lot, you relate something to something you know, that's another kind of act. And and metacognition is crucial for, for learning to do something new. And some people are better at it than others. So what we're creating here, like I'm interested in these situations in which these illusions pop up and, and how they arise and how you can maybe repair them or what their consequences are. There, I, I was thinking about something I uh, saw on, on uh, TikTok recently is somebody saying the problem with, with stupidity is that you don't know that you're stupid. <laughs> and and uh, is there, I guess what you're poking at there a little bit is, is there a way to get people to step back and realize what they don't know? Yeah, well, that would be really... That would, that would be, be really useful. important. Yeah, it would be useful. I mean, sometimes you can, like in a classroom, which is easier to deal with than like reality because <laughs> like it's a controlled environment. So in a classroom, I can ask you questions and reveal what you know and what you don't know. I can give you a quiz and you'll take away from that what you know and what you don't know. Um, get feedback on an assignment. But in real life, real life, you know, like it's just, <laughs> You would see people, I'm sure, on TikTok who are making it clear that they don't know what they don't know, mm -hmm. and they're just blustering. And then the question is, how do they learn? How do they come to learn that they're wrong? Yeah. How, you know, that's a terrible you place that, to leave this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. But, but that'll make me happy that I have crushed some dreams then. <laughs> That's your favorite thing. All right. Well, I am going to leave us on that depressing ending note. Uh, if people want to follow you online, uh, let's see, you, you've been doing some Mastodon tooting there. A little I bit, have, but not very much. Tweeting? I'm both. I'm Dr. Lamb Chop everywhere. Dr. Except Lamb at work where I'm not. <laughs> All right. Well, if you have uh, any complaints about what uh, Dr. Gary said, you're supposed to send, send them to Allison. Send Allison them to Allison. Allison at podfeed.com. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for coming on the show again, Marianne. This was great. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Chit Chat Across the Pond Light. Did you notice there weren't any ads in the show? That's because this show is not ad supported. It's supported by you. If you learned something, or maybe you were just entertained, consider contributing to the Podfeet podcast. You can do that by going over to podfeet.com and look for the big red button that says support the show. When you click that button, you're going to find different ways to contribute. If you'd like to do a one-time donation, you can click the PayPal button. If you want to make a recurring contribution, click the weekly Patreon button. You're only charged when I publish an episode of the NoSillaCast, which, let's face it, it's every single week, so I don't charge Patreon for Chit Chat Across the Pond Light or Programming by Stealth episodes. Another way to contribute is to record a listener contribution. It's a great way to help the Nocilla Castaways learn from you and takes a little bit of the load off of me doing all the work. If you want to contact me for any reason, you can email me at allison at podfeed.com and I really encourage you to follow me on Mastodon at podfeed at chaos.social. Maybe you want to talk to the other Nocilla Castaways. You can do that in our Slack group at podfeed.com slash Slack. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.